What's up? This is Elliot Einhorn. Welcome back to the Talk House podcast. Today I'm joined by Nick Dawson, editor in chief of Talk House Film. I am revved for today's podcast. This man is caffeinated and ready to go. Not caffeinated. I am high on life, my friend. Oh, wow. High on life. I'll have some of what he's having later. Now, listeners, today is the most recent in a series of episodes that Nick recorded himself with his own two hands. With my own two hands. Live at Sundance 2018. This one was intimate and wonderful and and really cool. It was a conversation between Hannah Fidel. Shouts. And Josephine Decker. Shouts. Two very gifted filmmakers, both of whom had new movies at Sundance 2018. And we recorded this conversation in Hannah's condo. She just put on a cup of tea. And a baked potato. And a baked potato. You will hear a cameo from the baked potato later. Now, Nick, you got to see both of their new films at Sundance. Tell us about those. Yeah. So what's kind of fascinating about this conversation is that their movies could hardly be more different from one another. Right. So Hannah's movie, The Long Dumb Road, is a fun, funny, quite masculine road movie comedy starring Tony Revolori from Grand Budapest Hotel and Jason Manzoukas from The League and Brooklyn Nine-Nine and a number of other awesome comedy shows. And... Josephine's movie, Madeline's Madeline, is a female-centric drama about a young woman of color who has mental health problems and is an aspiring actress. So they are very, very much at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Hannah's is, as she says, her version of a commercial movie. Josephine's is like really pushing the envelope in terms of finding new ways of conveying emotion and ideas through cinema. Now, Nick, while these movies might be quite different, it was fascinating for me to hear how much overlap these filmmakers had experientially. Absolutely. Kind of a central thread of the conversation was telling the stories of people of color as white filmmakers and and the incredible care and dedication that they had in in doing that and taking responsibility for these narratives. And of course, Hannah goes even further with her film being about two men. Absolutely. So an interesting backstory to, to The Long Dumb Road is it's inspired by a true incident from the life of Nat Sanders, the editor of Barry Jenkins' Oscar winning Moonlight. And Barry Jenkins, of course, a past guest here on Talk House Podcast. We collect them all. (laughs) Collect all of the good filmmakers here on the Talk House Podcast. Hannah co-wrote this movie with a man, the comedy writer Carson Mell. And she talks, you know, really interestingly about the process of putting herself into uh, a male perspective and how different that is from how she sees the world. Hannah and Josephine also get into some childhood storytelling games. Yeah, no, this is one of my favorite parts of any podcast I've ever recorded. We get to see the way that brilliant filmmakers start constructing stories at an incredibly early age and the amazing ways in which they do it. I'm not going to spoil any of that, but um, it does involve hobos and, and, <laughs> and sexually active Barbies, and I think that's all you need to know. We hear about how breaking new ground as an artist can often feel almost the same as failing. I've never heard somebody say that, but that's so true. Now, Nick, for the first time in our podcast series, we hear about clown breakdowns. It's not necessarily going to make a lot of sense to you, but neither is silencing exercises, but it will, and you'll be happy. I was very happy to hear them talk about these new TV shows they're making. I think they're both going to be excellent. And before we roll the tape, I just have to say, we are going to hear from this baked potato. Be ready for it. Appreciate it. Its cameo is meaningful. And Josephine had just come from seeing Hannah's film, right? She had, and she was very excited to talk to Hannah about it. Let's roll it. Cool. <laughs> well, uh, I just saw your movie. <laughs> it was so, it's, I like, I have so many questions for you. I, first of all, I love that you chose this as your next film. <laughs> and I'm wondering what, okay, so you said you had a co-writer on it. Yes. Does that mean, and you were the lead writer? Uh, no. Uh, well, we came up with the idea together okay. and then... My co-writer, Carson Mell, has a show on TBS. So he was, for sort of the second half of the development process, he was very much wrapped up in his own writer's room. What's his show? It's called Tarantula. Oh, nice. It's an animated show. It's so good. Wow. It's actually, I feel like Tarantula and The Long Dim Road are really good partners for each other because it's both about weirdos traveling around and their stories. Yeah, it really, uh, I really loved, um, it's funny because, well, one thing that I learned in theater school was this game, it was called, it was, it was play, they always said play the game to its end, like play the game to its end. And I feel like you, it's so nicely a, a film that like plays the game to <laughs> yeah. the end and really is satisfying in that way. Um, yeah. 
I was, you know, it's funny also on the way over here, I was thinking how it's, it feels like it's a story about transformation. Yeah. And I was wondering if you also feel like you transformed <laughs> over the course of making it. Yeah. Yes, I did. I, when we were asked, just before I go into that, when we were asked to do this chat, I was so excited because our movies could really not be any different. They're so different. <laughs> uh, like, uh, they are the opposite ends of the spectrum, which I think is the coolest thing ever. Yes. Um, but to answer your question, so I really was inspired by Richard Linklater's film, Everybody Wants Some, and how much fun I had just hanging out with those guys in that movie. And I wanted this film to have the same vibe. And while I don't think that the guys in Everybody Wants Them necessarily transformed, I just really, I liked just the hang. And so that was sort of the same principle that I took to this. And I also knew that I wanted to make something a little more commercial too. And just to see like what my version of commercial would be, which is still like perhaps not that <laughs> commercial, but, um, you know, I knew that sort of the rule of making a commercial movie is like your characters really do have to transform mm -hmm. or they have to like make it to their destination and succeed in some way. So I think the fact that they, the movie is really, okay, they have to, both of them have a destination that they're trying to get mm -hmm. to. And they both make it there, spoiler alert, yeah. um, it was something new for me that I've never done because there's always been so much ambiguity in my endings that actually this film is sort of a response to because I got really tired of getting asked, well, what happens after the movie's over? What happens to the characters? Are they still together? Does she go to jail? So... Um, <laughs> So this was sort of in response to all of that. Wow. <laughs> and it's really nice what your response. I love that the ending, like the very ending, I mean, I don't want to give anything away, but it felt like it was really one of my favorite parts of the film because it felt like you you really said something about like the process. You were yeah. like, the destination is really um, like a... Uh, not as important as the it's a journey. secondary to the journey. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, yeah. maybe the destination is very disappointing. Yeah. When you get there. Yeah. 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 No, it, it was, um, it was a lot of fun Yeah, to try something new. Um, let's talk about your movie because I saw it at its premiere and it was amazing. I didn't get a chance to stay for the Q and A. So now I get to ask you oh, all good. the questions. That's great that I have afterwards. Yes. The first one being, um, and you mentioned uh, that you went to um, drama school. I did, yeah. And this, the film is like very much about process and mm -hmm. acting and performance and what that means told through a type of performance as someone who isn't classically trained in any sort of acting. I was like, fascinated by mm. this and coming to it completely without the sort of knowledge of sort of the behind the scenes technical mm -hmm. element of creating experiential performances and experiential acting. I don't know if that's the right term. Um, yeah. But w my question is just what's your own background in doing the sort of stuff that Molly Parker's right. character was um, directing the actors yeah. to do. You know, it's interesting because, so this theater school that I went to is uh, Pig Iron Theater Company's advanced performance training in Philadelphia. And it's really inspired by Lecoq, which is a, um, well, he was a great teacher um, and of, cl of clown, but more like European clown. So it's really yeah. physical theater, building work from the body and from gesture is like the de departure for creation. So um, letting that lead instead of maybe dialogue or words on a page, which is something that I'm so interested in, period. I mean, I think that's why I... It was funny because after I spent a year in physical theater school, right after my last two films came out, my last two films came out, and then like four months later, I put myself into full time. It's like 30 hours a week theater school. Oh, I had no idea. School. Oh my God, I want to do that. It, well, yeah, I mean, it was kind of fun and it was kind of like 
I, like halfway through, I was like, what am I doing? Like, I, like, I was like, I had a career. Remember when I had a career? And now I'm in theater school with like a lot of 23-year-olds. Um, where, where did you end up going? So I went to Pig Iron oh, School. Oh, you did? Yes, yeah. yeah. And actually, I, so I had worked with them off and on. I took a course with them in college, and then I actually worked with them as, a, as an assistant writer, as an assistant stage manager, as a puppeteer, like over the first maybe seven years after I got out of college. Um, and then I got, you know, started doing fiction film and got kind of wrapped up in that. But so I always loved their process and their work. And um, a lot of the concept for the film came out of a, they have a summer intensive, which is actually, if you're going to do something, I would really recommend. Yeah. If you're going to do some, you know, weird theater thing, it's three weeks and it's in Philadelphia. And um, it was amazing because I did that, I guess, probably the summer of, maybe it was the summer of 2013. And you just spend a week on neutral mask, a week on comedia, and then a week on clowning is the last part. And the clowning, you know, you're breaking the fourth wall. So you're really, you're responding to other people on stage, but you're mostly responding to the audience. Yeah. And it's all about how, uh, clowning is all about how to be very present to the audience and you can't ignore anything. You cannot let anything happen in the room without like noticing it. If the clown it doesn't notice the things that happen in the room, like he's not, you're no longer clowning, I guess, is kind of the rule. And I loved that concept of like being so alive to the audience. And I also loved the breaking this, you know, the breaking the wall between you and the audience. And I wanted to make a film that kind of broke that wall, I guess. You did. Oh, good. Yeah, <laughs> you did. It was so amazing to watch and, oh, wow. and feel and experience. That's cool. I'm yeah. glad to hear you say that. That was definitely a goal. I haven't said that out loud in a while, but that was a big you know, reason I wanted to make it. And, and in that first um, three week uh, experience with them, people just, it was funny in that clown workshop, you know, they, to create the clown, you go up there with an idea of what your clown is. And then, um, usually your teachers kind of play clowns as well. And they just like grill you and you fall apart on stage. Basically you have like 30 minutes on stage, just alone, falling apart in front of like 20 people watching you, you know, and you're just, you're improvising the whole thing. And it's, it's, it's miserable. And they like, you know, they kind of attack you and the clown is forced to make decisions and like work under pressure. And that's kind of how you find your clown, or at least it was in, in ours training. Yeah. And the things that people found were so real and honest and more them. I mean, we'd been together for three weeks and we're, and that, that is a very intensive program. That's actually eight hour, eight or eight or more hours a day. Oh my God. And we'd spent three, three weeks together. So you think, you know, those people pretty well by yeah. then. The things I saw, I was like, wow, I have I don't know if that person's ever seen that part of themselves in their actual life, you know? Yeah. I think that's what's beautiful about training as an actor. You can find a part of yourself that, um, you know, uh, that is you, but it's not your habit, I guess. So, yeah. so I really was interested in like what honesty happens in performance. Like how does a performance, how can a performance be more real than reality? How can I as a filmmaker create the experience that an actor has when they go into a performance and like become something else? Could I, could I make an experience where the audience becomes something else? So um, anyway, those, yeah, I made, said a high, it was a challenge. I made, made myself some challenging proposals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you succeeded. That's good to hear. And I fully agree with what Richard Brody wrote too, which is just like you really are creating an entirely new way of um, cinema. And it's real. it's That's like a big fucking amazing. Compliment. No, Thanks, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really amazing. It feels, ironically, it's so funny how much it feels like failing. I mean, I cannot, it, feel, it feels like failing all the way. I mean, even here I'm like, I really, I don't, you know, it's like, I know some people like it and they've written about it, but I'm also like, who hates it? You know, somebody <laughs> hates it and they're just not telling me. And I'm going to find out later in some terrible way, you know, very publicly. Cause I think, but that's also maybe my way of like shielding myself from yeah. the disappointment of it's a natural, you know, it's I true. feel the same way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. You well, really don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, something I thought about that ha our films kind of also have in common, which is interesting, um, uh, I think it'd be interesting to maybe talk about is, I was thinking how you have a situation where you have two people of color yeah. going through the South and kind of an, almost an aggressively white South. Yeah. And I don't know that race has ever commented on directly. And I, and I think in my film, there's, I think it's a little bit more present, the conversation around race, but yeah. it's also... You know, I tried hard not to make to make the issues that arise in the film very complicated and not just about that. Yeah. Um, but I'm 
I don't know, I just wanted to ask you about that and about that choice in casting and if you were writing for specifically those characters and um, uh, or if you were just casting and you were like, I love this guy's performance and I want to put him in this role. And yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, so we, when we took the movie out to financiers, we were very lucky in that a company called Game Changer Films ended up financing. And they specifically... Their goal is to put female directors on projects so they only finance female helmed films, but also they want to change the conversation also in front of the camera. So a real push for diversity in casting. So it was um, their suggestion that we, and thank God they suggested this because I think it just made the film that much more interesting um, that we think about casting someone of color in the role of Nat, who is played by Tony Rebellori, who is of Guatemalan descent. Um, and I ended up, I met with a bunch of um, other actors for the role of Richard, his sort of down on his luck friend that he picks up and uh, ended up with Jason Manzukis, who I've just been a fan of for years and, um, and it just happens that his skin is a little bit, you know, more brown, even though he's actually Greek. <laughs> but um, after we had cast the film, there was a real conversation that we had behind the scenes of, OK, well, should Tony speak Spanish to his parents in the beginning scene, which it actually then turned into a montage? Uh, should we really address race in the film? Because... It's actually, you know, there's two schools of thought, but is it progressive? And I'm still not sure exactly which one's correct, but I like to believe that by not addressing race and just having these guys as the protagonist, that that in itself is a progressive act. But on the other hand, the reality is that my privilege to then be able to say like, actually, that's like a fictionalized experience that like a white girl would think that these guys would have on the road when in reality, like race actually is a part of their daily lives and we should have um, perhaps addressed it a little more. I don't know what the right answer is, but it's something that we definitely talked heavily about. Um, And at the same time, I think since we started making the film, the idea of colorblind casting And the sort of political correctness of it may have shifted itself where you see people accepting awards saying, thank you for allowing me as a black man to play this amazing role of a black man. No one writes black characters and this uh, as well. And um, and so it was really I don't know, the the streets are hot. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And um, the sort of anything relating to race and racial experiences in America, it's, it's so confusing. Mm. Um, I don't know if you felt that way when you were making the film, but um, yeah, definitely. I mean, and I think it helps a lot. I mean, and I'm curious about your process with your co-writer because I think for us, I think so much of the film was forged through a lot of very, very collaborative process. So I think that that helped in like learning how to maybe speak to that issue in a way that also was a little bit more from the inside of that issue than I would be, than I, than I personally am. Um, but we had, we improvised on weekends for about eight months with a, a very diverse room of actors. Um, oh, that's so we have cool. an Asian, Asian producer. Yeah. It was about f- I think maybe 50% people of color in that, in that rehearsal space. And so there was a real, um, the conversation about race obviously arose at various moments and then and then also didn't arise in, in other moments. But when it came up, it came up really strongly about like, and it wasn't even necessarily even issues that are in the film. It was like, I remember we did one really hard exercise, a really challenging, it was something that, so I worked with Quinn Boridel, who was one of the founding directors of Pig Iron. He came and helped co-lead some workshops and he had, he had offered up a a uh, practice around that they use when they're doing tragedy and Greek tragedy of a way to approach violence Mm -hmm. Um, because we were kind of exploring like we were exploring anxiety and depression we were also exploring um, early on we were exploring incarceration which is very similar to the film and then eventually it was like this is such a huge can of worms 
incarceration, like I would need to study that for three to five yeah. years before I would feel comfortable making a film. And honestly, the deeper in I got, I might be like, oh shit, you know, am I the right person to tell the story? Even though I think it's actually really important to um, also take on stories that you're, um, that's how you learn, right? Yeah. You start making something that you, uh, that you need to learn more yeah. about, that you're passionate about. But when we were still thinking that maybe we would, you know, use some of that, he was like, you know, maybe the actors, it might be nice to improvise some work around violence. And so there was this, uh, silencing exercise where you would have the actors memorize one actor well all the actors memorize something and then you'd have two people on either side of them try to silence them as they spoke so they hold them very firmly the person speaks and the two people holding them try to silence them in any way that they can and it's gets very intense like very very quickly it's also very intense to watch someone be silenced and I think um, and what was interesting was that one woman I can't remember if she was in the process of doing it or was watching it, had one of our actors had a very big response and, and was like, I can't do this. I feel really uncomfortable with this. I can't believe we're doing this and left the room. And then it arose that like, I mean, part of it was like, okay, maybe we needed to do some warm ups to get into the frame of mind for that. But also what arose is like, who, what, she was a white woman who left the room and it was kind of like, who was allowed to leave the room? Yeah. And the black, the black actors, people of color in the room were like, we're not allowed to leave the room when something's uncomfortable to us. And in right. a way, we're, this is, you know, we're held to a different standard. Like, and, and who's allowed to be a mess? Yeah. And, and so that kind of question around whiteness. And it, was, and it was an issue that I, it was fascinating in a way because I was like, oh, that's just something I'm blind to. The, the privilege of being a mess. And also, I mean, in, it comes up in subtle ways. Like, I look homeless most of the time. <laughs> but people don't think I've just robbed a bank or like right. that I might be the guy who just, you know, got in trouble for like <laughs> stealing something around the corner. Like, I, I dress really in my pajamas all the time. I'm wearing makeup now. It's like, this is the only week I've worn makeup in the last probably you two years. Both. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so the... Yeah, it, it it just illuminated a lot of things, and it was and it was really uh, a gorgeous honor to be in the room and share those conversations because yeah. I think um, I think it's also can be really exhausting for people of color to have to train white artists in how to be a little bit more wise. Yeah, but so I feel really grateful to the people who took the time to kind of like um, that we did take the time out to sort of talk through some of those issues, and and I think even though that, for instance, what we just talked about isn't in the film at all. I think yeah. that kind of conversation affected the film a lot. Sure. Yeah. What was interesting as I was editing the film and and having friends come and watch it, and oh, we got a lot of responses of, oh, there's this built-in tension in Long Dem Road because Tony is Hispanic and we're taught that, like, something bad is going to happen because this is a Hispanic character or a non-white character. In a character. very, very white world, yeah. Exactly. And so they're like, oh, every twist and turn, we thought like, okay, this is the moment oh, where no, something really? is going to happen. Oh, so, so that was also just fascinating to see that even just the color of Tony's skin, like up the tension of yeah, the film. yeah in a way that it wouldn't have otherwise. I, don't, I've, I find it really sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. It's very, it is a very interesting conversation. Yeah, it is. Um, your film is also about two male characters. Yeah. And I'm wondering how that was, like, going along for that experience and directing these two male actors and writing for two male actors. Yeah. And if it was, if you felt, like, excited and empowered by that or if you were like oh how do I fucking do you know do this yeah. yeah it was so exciting it was so exciting to sort of learn how to live in their world and as it is anytime you're writing any character but I've I maybe I shouldn't say this so publicly but I realized that my films so far have all been sort of based on an important guy in my life. And so this is very much in that um, trajectory of sort of, I can pinpoint in my own history of like, okay, who am I trying to understand from my past um, by getting into these characters' minds? Maybe not as much as the first two films, but that is part of the process for me uh, so far. 
Wow. I know. It's trippy. It's really interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, now I'm like, who was it? Was it someone you dated or was it like a friend? <laughs> the, <laughs> for this one, it was, um, it was a friend. It was it, my friend, Nat Sanders. Do you know Nat? Yeah. Yeah. And we were on a hike one day and he was like, what's the craziest thing that's ever happened to you? And I was like, I don't have a story. I feel very sheltered. And I don't know. I like, that's such a bizarre question to ask someone just walking up a mountain. And he was like, well, here's what happened to me. And I, I am speaking as Nat Sanders now, but he's like, I picked up this sort of drifter guy and him and his buddy. And I, was obsessed with the book on the road by Kerouac. And so I wanted to like live my life like Kerouac. And then I realized that that was a really terrible (laughs) mistake. And so, um, he ended up in real life leaving these guys after it got like too much for him, uh, leaving these guys, I think at a gas station. And then the Richard character, uh, still calls him from time to time just to like check in on him, which I love. And so there's something so fascinating about Nat's position in this of being obsessed with the idea of, you know, the great American road trip, but also the fact that he thought it would be a great idea to allow these guys in his car, where as a woman, I would absolutely never do that. And maybe that's just, I don't know if you would, but it, for me, I mean, I'm like terrified of walking down the street at night alone. So I definitely wouldn't um, allow two sort of sketchy looking dudes in my car. I feel the same way. Like I can't, I haven't slept outside as much as I would have liked to or um, yeah, picked up as many hitchhikers. So yeah. would have likely because you kind of like the risks for, I mean, I'm sure there's there's definitely risks for men as well, but yes. it's, you assess them a little differently when you're a woman. Who, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, because of that, I found it so it was so great to be able to step into Nat's character and like mm. live out that fantasy of being in a position where I could do that. That's so cool. Yeah. So yes, it was um, empowering in that sense. It's really interesting because also I think um, in the film Madeline's Madeline that I did I feel like we were I was really like obsessed with this question of like how do you tell a story from a person's point of view who is yeah. not you yeah and then ironically it's funny because I worked so hard to get inside of her point of view um that there's moments when I oh no oh is Sorry. that the that's the timer oh the timer Are oh great potato? oh yes the baked potato <laughs> <laughs> and we're back <laughs> <laughs> but I it's so funny because I like in early cuts of the film I wasn't really happy with how she the main character Madeline came across in the first half and I was like ah it's really morose and I don't want her to be such a victim she's got so much light she's got so much imagination and I spent I literally spent like six months working on the beginning and then you know towards the end this conversation arises about like are you qualified to tell someone else's story? Is anyone qualified to tell someone else's yeah. story? And are you specifically qualified to tell this person's story? And, um, but then ironically, when I really had fixed the beginning, was happier with the beginning, I was like, I was like, oh, it's, is it a little weird that I'm calling myself after something that I think now I'm like, oh, am I just like adding another question to the audience that like maybe I figured out, but it took a long time. You know, it's, it takes a long time to do someone's experience justice. And I'm just trying to do justice to a character, a fictional character, yeah. you know, and make her as alive and full and real as I can. And yeah, it's, it's just funny how I think I, sometimes I'm like, uh, I, I hold myself to very high standards that I'm not really even clear what they are sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I also think this is the joy of doing what we do as artists is like getting to go inside of someone else's yeah. head and to become someone else. And that's something I've been doing in a way since I was like four. And I yeah, had like too. two little mouse puppets that like 
lived on the opposite sides of the room. And literally I played a game with them over the course of two years where like one got kidnapped and had lived on the other side of the room and they would like look, the other one on the other side of the room would look at like almost like, like as if, you know, the sailing ships in the middle of the room might hold the other mouse, you know, <laughs> and it was a very long term storytelling, but it, uh, that was about distance, but it was all about like longing over long periods of time yeah. for these two little mouse, you know, I still have them, mouse creatures anyway. Uh, you point, do? That's amazing yeah, that you still yeah, they have stayed them. In, well, they stayed, they, my mom, my mom has, my room in, from high school is very much the same. Oh my she God, finally, amazing. She, she finally was like, you might need to clean this out because nobody can walk in here because it's just, it's like a dust festival. Oh, <laughs> it's just no. so a pres- preserved shrine of Josephine at age 18. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. Um, what's funny is that as a kid, I used to play hobo, mm. which also sort of fits for Longdom Road where I would pretend I was a hobo and jump in and out of... Um, the closet, the closet was a train car. <laughs> and then uh, I would have all these imaginary friends who I'd talk to. In the- oh, that's so nice. <laughs> yeah. And I would like carry a stick with a little sack. <laughs> the weirdest game to play. As an only child, I like always was, you know, I, I think it helped sort of, it forces you to live inside of other worlds yes. and other minds in, in a way. Yeah. I wasn't an only child, but I just didn't have very many friends. <laughs> I, but I really spent a lot of time alone playing with. I remember like the Barbies would always um, like have sex surreptitiously, like under the pillow, and then and they would feel really bad and guilty about it, and then they would commit suicide by jumping out the window. Oh no! <laughs> Those were some good oh, no. good times. I was like, I was like, I want this to be dark. I was like, she's sad, and you know, she shouldn't have done it, and then she would jump out the window. Very much like a Texas version of femininity. Oh my god, amazing! Can I ask you some more questions yeah, please, about your sure. film? Okay, so your lead actress. How do you pronounce her name? Helena. Helena Howard. Yeah, she is amazing. I as soon as I saw your film, I am casting something right now, and I immediately called the casting director. I was like, "Who reps her?" And then I like had to track. I then I got her info from Adam Kirsch, who's our shared film publicist. And then I it was like a whole. I was like on a mission to meet with her. Oh, good. Um, and she is just incredible. As is the rest of her cast. Miranda July is always amazing. So is Molly Parker. Um, how did you find Helena? I met her in an acting festival. She was, she's what, four years ago. So she was 15. Um, and I was judging like a teen arts festival in New Jersey, which I did once a year. And I would do like a little weird acting workshop, um, that, you know, it was like, I would have the like middle schoolers, like walk across the room in slow motion. And then like, do that a few times and then tell a story in slow motion, like one word at a time across. It was like, I was using all these weird techniques that I was kind of (laughs) making up from like Buto and all. Anyway, it was fun. And then actually uh, she, there was a section that I would do, I would judge some of the, or it was like just give feedback basically to people doing monologues. Um, So for like maybe two hours, you know, there'd be like every three minutes, somebody does a monologue then they finish. I give like a minute of feedback and they leave and, you know, just responses. And then, um, they're mostly doing things, comedy scenes or like frozen scenes. And then she got up and did a monologue from, um, Blackbird, a very Mm. intense Broadway show about a woman who, um, reconnects with her, a a man who abused her when she was a child, sexually abused her. And so she does like this intense monologue from that show. And I, remember just the silence that I felt inside me watching that and the total awe and she finished and I just started crying I mean it's funny even talking about it like I have to talk about it all the time but talking about it with you feels a little different like I really started crying and I was like that was the best performance I ever saw in my life wow and then she said um and I was like I don't have anything else to say (laughs) and then she started crying and then there's like 40 16 year olds in the room who are like what the fuck (laughs) just happened um (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and then and then it's funny because 
the way I always tell stories and then we exchanged information. The way she tells the story is, and then this crazy lady chased me down the hall oh and was God. like, can you, can we, why did she attract her? this crazy woman chasing her around? <laughs> she was like, yeah, she finished her monologue and I was like, that was really special. And you know, I'd love to stay in touch. I think yeah. I can't remember if I got her information or if I just gave her mine, but I met with her and her mom maybe like a month later in New York and just said, I wanted to create a devised piece, you know, really connecting with actors and building with them. And would she be willing Willing to be involved so she was part of our rehearsal process for like two years before we made Amazing. this film. Oh that's so cool. Yeah it was very yeah, cool. Yeah she's very special. Yeah <laughs> so well this is so interesting because I feel like you did this huge jump from your last movie to this yeah. movie and in some ways like a teacher is wildly I think when I told you after I saw it was that I felt like an elastic band had been pulled very very tight <laughs> yeah. and I was like it never really lets go. No it doesn't. And it's very wonderful. That's how, that's how I felt at the time though. Yes. Which is very different than, than how, how I feel it. now. Oh, really? You felt that there was a lasting bend? Oh, yeah. Big time. Oh, wow. Yeah. About what? Uh, I was like just living this like really, it was at a point where I was like, okay, I, just creatively, how do I, what am I doing with my life? What, like, there was just a lot of fear and tension and anxiety around like, what is my purpose? Yes. What am I doing? I'm in my late twenties, I'm like borrowing money from my parents. I hate this. I think also like I have no boyfriend, but everything sort of translated into that film, all of those feelings. Um, whereas my life is like very different now. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. So yeah. what does that mean that you're thinking about working on now the, after? Cause it seemed, I'm so curious, like the huge <laughs> jump from a teacher to this and I didn't see six years, so I yeah. should have seen that. But I, um, but from a teacher to a uh, long dumb road is yeah. obviously a big transformation, which actually isn't that long ago. I mean, a teacher no. came out what, four years ago, five, yeah, five years ago. But now, what is, are you, are you, what's next? What, what is the, I mean, or what, yeah. maybe it's better to say like, what is the uh, self experience you're having that might uh, influence your next <laughs> choice of film? Great question. <laughs> um, I don't, I honestly don't know if I'm, I'm going to make a film next. Oh. Um, I've sort of been working more in TV. So, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So continuing with, um, I've been developing a teacher as a TV show for years now and it's evolved and it's been at various networks and also the sort of tone of the show has evolved too. So it's like, it's, it's definitely not a comedy by any means, but it is very much different from the film itself. So that's been a really interesting sort of self exploration of how do I deal with the same subject matter, but also evolve in my own right as a creator too. Right. Um, and how does that translate? So um, that's, I think, what's next up. But yeah, yeah. What I mean, how are you feeling about, you know, next projects and... Well, the next project I'm supposed to direct is this summer a project about Shirley Jackson, which amazing. is so cool. And I love amazing writer from the 40s. Um, who it's shocking that she's not more famous than she is because her work is stunning and like all about identity and kind of fractured consciousness and the way that uh, I think as women, it's very um, how affected you are by the people around you and yeah. by um, the world around you. So I'm so excited to make that. And, and, but I also am really thinking a lot about TV and in terms of the next thing that I would generate, because that script is not by me, that's by Sarah Gubbins, who's pretty awesome. She wrote, I love Dick. Oh, um, amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, but I think the, the next thing that I would want to make after, um, like for my, in terms of my own writing would be a TV show that I've, yeah. or, that I've been thinking about for a long time. So it is not developed at all yet, but, um, but it would be set in the wilderness with a lot of women. And I Amazing. think that sounds like a really good place to, um, like hibernate and create and, you know, like, I love that my research would have to be like, go live on a midwifery commune for like a month. <laughs> that sounds like a really nice research project. So yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about next. But I'm, I'm really excited to work on other people's scripts actually because yeah. I think I've been writing my own stuff for a long time and Same. it's really exhausting. It is. By yeah. the time you get to directing it, you're like, oh yeah, okay, right. This is part of the process too. Now I have to kind of start again. <laughs> yeah, it's a totally different yeah. mindset. Yes. 
Oh, that's so cool. I want to watch your show in the woods. Yeah. Please, I want to watch your, te- your a teacher, <laughs> yeah. a whole new version. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, thanks, Hannah. Thank this you. is so nice. Yeah. Well, this is great. Yeah. I'm really glad we got to do this too, because yeah. we need to hang out more. And, and now it's like officially <laughs> sanctioned <Yes>. hanging out. <laughs> Thank you, Talk House. Yes. Thanks, <laughs> Nick. <laughs> Nick Dawson, bringing fantastic filmmakers together since before the first video camera was invented. Uh, yes, that is very true. <laughs> and, uh, of course, go back, check out our other officially talk house sanctioned podcast from Sundance 2018, Andrew Ann in conversation with Christina Cho. And one of my favorites this year so far, Boots Riley in conversation with Ronaldo Marcus Green. Listeners, if you have not checked out Boots' film, Sorry to Bother You, Get to the theater. This is a movie to see on the big screen. And of course, Josephine's movie, Madeline's Madeline, is out in theaters from tomorrow, August 10th, through Oscilloscope. See it. It is fantastic. Listeners, make sure to head over to iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe. We have some very cool episodes recorded live at Pitchfork Fest 2018 coming down the pipeline, including next week's Leticia Tamco a.k.a. Vagabond, in conversation with Julie Byrne. And of course, go check us out on Instagram where you will not see any pictures of this podcast because I was too flustered to take any. (laughs) He's a nervous engineer. I was very nervous. But we do have some very cool footage of Japanese breakfast arm wrestling Alex Cameron. Classic stuff. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, and of course, YouTube, where there's full video episodes. And go daily, of course, to talkcast.com for the amazing written content that we have there from artists and film and music and beyond. Today's episode was, of course, recorded by you, Nick Dawson. Competence is my middle name. (laughs) And co-produced by Mark Yoshizumi. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Until next week, I'm Elia Einhorn. I'm Nick Dawson. Peace. I'll have some of what he's having later. Now, waiters... (laughs) Service people. (laughs) Garcon. (laughs) 